Hello, my name is Ken Grout, and I'm a member of the faculty here in the Communication Studies Department at Emerson College in Boston, Massachusetts. And I want to welcome all of you to the Southwick Recital Spring 2021 edition. I am speaking to you right now. I'm in the Helen Rose Room, the beautiful Helen Rose Room here in the Walker Building on Emerson's Boston campus, right on Boylston Street, right across the street from the Commons. And in this room, on the wall behind me, we have three portraits of June Hamblin Mitchell, Kenneth Cornell, and Francis Crowley Lashoto. And they were three of the absolute giants of the Southwick. They're three of the reasons, frankly, that I'm able to sit here and talk to you about this now, because they kept the Southwick alive and thriving throughout many years in the 20th century. And it's a real honor, frankly, to share this space with them, even this way. Now, this semester, as was the case last fall, our Southwick recital is going to be presented as a virtual event. And last fall, we had student presenters for the very first time, and it was just wonderful. This semester, we're going to follow a more traditional path. Our presentation focuses on two early 20th century authors, Edith Wharton and Louis Bromfield. Now, these two met and shared a friendship that would last decades, and their letters back and forth illustrate their shared passion both for literature and for horticulture. And it is those letters that form the cornerstone of our recital this semester. A cultivated friendship is a piece that has been developed and will be presented by John Dennis Anderson and Karen Varanch of Concord University in um, Athens, West Virginia. And John Dennis Anderson, of course, is uh, one of Emerson's own. And they have developed a cultivated friendship and are using Daniel Bratton's edition of the letters between Wharton and Bromfield as the source material for the work that they've developed. Now, the video version of A Cultivated Friendship was originally commissioned by the Ashland, Ohio Chautauqua, and we are most grateful to the performers, the presenters, the writers, and the Ashland, Ohio Chautauqua for allowing us to share this work with all of you. Now, we will start the recital um, with the documentary that talks about the history of the Southwicks. And it's a, a short, it's about a 10 minute documentary film that I hope you'll enjoy. And then after that, we will have a selection uh, by Wharton that hopefully will introduce you to or remind you of what a beautiful wordsmith Edith Wharton was. Then after we uh, enjoy a cultivated friendship, we'll close the proceedings with a brief selection from the writings of Bromfield, an author whose love of nature and conservation were always clearly conveyed through his words and ideas. So. Again, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Southwick, and I hope you enjoy. In the fall of 1900, Henry Lawrence Southwick announced a series of interpretive recitals of Shakespearean comedy to be presented in Steinert Hall, 162 Boylston Street, Boston, on consecutive Friday evenings. The cost for a single subscription to the six recital series? Five dollars. And the series sold out. The Southwick series that began in the 1900s uh, became part of the popular offerings uh, for culture. And they became part of the cultural scene uh, alongside of the Lyceum, the lectures, uh, the Chautauqua circuit. And this prevailed uh, for much of the early part of the uh, 20th century. This notion of Southwick's, of oral interpretations of works written either for the stage, as with Shakespeare, or for the parlor, as with Alcott, was not a new one. 
the idea of presenting literature, both dramatic and otherwise, as an article of communication by a single interpreter, rather than as theater by a cast of actors, had been around for some time. There was a long-standing puritanical prejudice against theater. Actors and actresses were believed to be immoral, you know. <laughs> and platform performance provided a way around that anti-theatrical prejudice. Platform performances avoided sets and costumes and the morally suspect act of pretending to be someone you're not, of taking on a role. By staying within the more acceptable conventions of public speaking and lecturing. Platform performers, as these single interpreters came to be called, were an increasingly popular commodity in this country during the second half of the 19th century. Individuals presenting an entire play or an extensive rendering of prose or poetry offer an evening's entertainment and enlightenment. The best of the lot made a handsome living touring and presenting works from authors, playwrights and poets, both classic and modern. The most important author that was presented was Shakespeare. And one of the reasons was it was someone who spoke the language, who understood the language, spoke it clearly and made it meaningful and made it part of a, a person in the drama. As the acceptance and perceived legitimacy of such staged readings grew, certain authors took on the task of touring and presenting their own work themselves, partly as a marketing venture to increase sales of their written product, but also to ride the wave of popularity that platform performances were then enjoying. Of the well-known and successful two stood out, Charles Dickens and Mark Twain both toured extensively and both made significantly more money from their presentations during this time than they did from actual sales of their books. Dickens had considered an acting career as a young man and was an avid and acclaimed participant in amateur theatricals later in his life. So his effectiveness as a platform reader is perhaps no surprise. What was a surprise was how phenomenally popular his readings were, like that of a rock star in our time. It should come as no surprise that platform readings did well in Boston, and it makes sense, too, that a certain intimacy would form during those years between the art of interpreting literature and a burgeoning house of oratory study known as Emerson College. The literary recital started by Southwick in 1900 became a popular and lucrative attraction for the young institution. In the early days, Emerson was out there as a public venue, the, the Southwicks were, and thus they drew in the public, and there was a public to be drawn in. Southwick often headlined the proceedings. He had taught at Emerson and was subsequently dean before being installed as the third president of the college from 1908 until his death in 1932. Although these presentations were rechristened the Southwick recitals in his honor after his passing, many outside presenters appeared over the years, along with an array of Emerson faculty members, including Southwick's wife, Jessie Eldridge Southwick, herself a scholar and quality interpreter of Shakespeare. Leland Powers, who gained popularity for acting all the roles in plays on his own and was noted for being, quote, the first man on the platform in America to do this. Walter Bradley Tripp, who toured widely with his solo performance of David Copperfield. Edith Coburn Noyes, one of whose great triumphs was the old English comedy, She Stoops to Conquer. June Hamblin Mitchell, known to all on campus as Mama Mitchell, whose interpretations of Romeo and Juliet and the royal family were crowning achievements. Frances Crowley Lesciotto, renowned for, among others, her singular interpretation of the play, Papa is All. Kenneth Cornell, regarded for his mastery of American musicals, My Fair Lady and The King and I. Dorothy Maines Prince, lauded for delivering and bringing to life the poetry of Maya Angelou and Phyllis Wheatley. And John Dennis Anderson, 
known for working in the Chautauqua tradition and for his stellar interpretation of The Mutual Friend by Frederick Bush. Some of the most memorable uh, Southwick recitals for me were the ones by professors of oral interpretation at other colleges and universities as guest artists on the series. And in particular, I, I fondly remember Mary Frances Hopkins of Louisiana State University performing the story I Stand Here Ironing by Tilly Olson. I only saw it on videotape because it was made in the 60s, but I remember how delighted Mary Frances was when I told her how much I enjoyed watching the videotape of that performance. As time progressed, the types of selections began to broaden in scope, as did the shape of the Southwick event itself. An evening might focus on a single piece as it did with Pouring Tea, Black Gay Men of the South Tell Their Tales in 2008, and William Faulkner, A Literary Chautauqua in 2011. But an audience might also encounter several performers of an evening and may hear Frost, Whitman, and Browning, bookended with Sophocles, Virginia Woolf, Tennessee Williams, Neil Simon, or an original work by the artist. Helen Rose, a trustee of the college for over 50 years, someone who had saved the college from going bankrupt, decided after the death of Princess Diana, let's do a Southwick, but let's do a Southwick in Paris at the Ritz. So we took one of our most gifted performers, we took a couple of professors and alums, and we went and performed a Southwick at the Ritz in Paris. And what was intriguing to me was the performer did Isabella Stewart Gardner, who really epitomized the spirit of Diana in terms of fierce independence. And as I sat there reflecting that day in a beautiful autumn day in Paris, here is the Southwick, very global, in Paris at the Ritz. On October 26th, 1900, the first of what would come to be revered as the Southwick recitals delighted a capacity crowd who came to hear Leland Powers' interpretation of The Taming of the Shrew by William Shakespeare. In the near century and a quarter since, the Southwick has stretched and shifted and opened itself to new forms, new ideas, new writers, new presenters, all the while with an eye on a section of the credo that President Southwick himself crafted in 1930 for the college's 50th anniversary celebration. I believe in the study of great literature through interpretation, for service to others and for self-realization and understanding. Even as the soul of a mother's lullaby lies locked in the printed notes upon a page and is released when the mother love sings it, so the artist reveals life mysteries in terms of sound and sight. Interpretation is the pathway to realization. Edith Wharton was a writer known for novels like House of Mirth and The Age of Innocence, most especially Ethan Frome. Now, this novel tells the story of Ethan and his wife, Zena, and their life together on their family farm outside the fictional town of Starkfield, Massachusetts. This particular section talks about Maddie Silver, and that's Zena's cousin, a young lady who was brought to the farm to act as Zena's aide. But Maddie's arrival in Starkfield, of course, brought with it much more than any of them could have possibly expected. And this section from Ethan Frome demonstrates what I mentioned before. It just shows the power of Horton's ability with the English language. Ethan Frome. 
Fro was in the habit of walking into Starkfield to fetch home his wife's cousin, Maddie Silver, on the rare evenings when some chance of amusement drew her to the village. It was his wife who had suggested, when the girl came to live with them, that such opportunities should be put in her way. Maddie Silver came from Stamford, and when she entered the Fromm's household to act as her cousin Zena's aide, it was thought best, as she came without pay, not to let her feel too sharp a contrast between the life she had left and the isolation of a Starkfield farm. But for this, as Fromm sardonically reflected, it would hardly have occurred to Zena to take any thought for the girl's amusement. When his wife first proposed that they should give Maddie an occasional evening out, he had inwardly demurred at having to do the extra two miles to the village and back after his hard day on the farm. But not long afterward, he had reached the point of wishing that Starkfield might give all its nights to revelry. Maddie Silver had lived under his roof for a year, and from early morning till they met at supper, he had frequent chances of seeing her, but no moments in her company were comparable to those when her arm in his and her light step flying to keep time with his long stride. They walked back through the night to the farm. He had taken to the girl from the first day when he had driven over to the flats to meet her and she had smiled and waved to him from the train crying out, you must be Ethan, as she jumped down with her bundles while he reflected looking over her slight person. She don't look much on housework, but she ain't a fretter anyhow. But it was not only that the coming to his house of a bit of hopeful young life was like the lighting of a fire on a cold hearth. The girl was more than the bright serviceable creature he had thought her. She had an eye to see and an ear to hear. He could show her things and tell her things and taste the bliss of feeling that all he imparted left long reverberations and echoes he could wake at will. It was during their night walks back to the farm that he felt most intensely the sweetness of this communion. He had always been more sensitive than the people about him to the appeal of natural beauty. His unfinished studies had given form to this sensibility and even in his unhappiest moments, field and sky spoke to him with a deep and powerful persuasion. But hitherto the emotion had remained in him as a silent ache, veiling with sadness the beauty that evoked it. He did not even know whether anyone else in the world felt as he did or whether he was the sole victim of this mournful privilege. Then he learned that one other spirit had trembled with the same touch of wonder, that at his side, living under his roof and eating his bread, was a creature to whom he could say, that's Orion down yonder. The big fella to the right is Aldebaran, and the bunch of little ones like bees swarming, they're the Pleiades. Or whom he could hold entranced before a ledge of granite thrusting up through the fern while he unrolled the huge panorama of the Ice Age and the long, dim stretches of succeeding time. The fact that admiration for his learning mingled with Maddie's wonder at what he taught was not the least part of his pleasure. And there were other sensations, less definable, but more exquisite which drew them together with a shock of silent joy. The cold red of sunset behind winter hills, the flight of cloud flocks over slopes of golden stubble, or the intensely blue shadows of hemlock on sunlit snow. When she said to him once, it looks just like it was painted it seemed to Ethan that the art of definition could go no farther and that words had at last been found 
to utter his secret soul. I hope you enjoyed that. And now let's get to the meat and potatoes of the recital. A Cultivated Friendship is a piece that has been developed by John Dennis Anderson and Karen Varanch, and they will be presenting it for us as well. And the piece is drawn from the letters written back and forth between the writers, Louis Bromfield and Edith Wharton, many of them written when both writers lived in France. And the addition of the letters that Anderson and Varanch used was an edition assembled by Daniel Bratton. Now, John Dennis Anderson is Associate Professor Emeritus of Communication Studies right here at Emerson College. Karen Varanch, an instructor of Communication Studies at Concord University in Athens, West Virginia. We're so pleased to have them as the presenters of this really lovely piece. So, without further ado, I take great pride in introducing a cultivated friendship. Edith Wharton lived from 1862 to 1937. She was born into a wealthy New York family and is well known as the author of such classic novels as The House of Mirth and Ethan Frome. Louis Bromfield lived from 1896 to 1956. He's mainly known today as an advocate of soil conservation and for establishing Malabar Farm in his native North Central Ohio. But before that, he was a novelist of note. His most famous novel probably being The Rains Came. Both Wharton and Bromfield were highly successful Pulitzer Prize winning authors. Wharton in 1921 for The Age of Innocence and Bromfield in 1927 for Early Autumn. Both also had work that was adapted for stage and screen. Wharton and Bromfield were born 34 years apart. They met when Bromfield was in his 30s and Wharton was almost 70. They became friends in the last years of Wharton's life while they were living near each other, north of Paris. Wharton had moved to France in 1910, and at the time of these letters, she owned a second home in the south of France near the French Riviera. Bromfield had moved to France in 1925. He was to return to America about a year after Wharton's death. So the creation of Malabar Farm in Ohio is still in his future at the time of his cultivated friendship with Edith Wharton. Travel with me to France in the 1930s and listen to the words of a cultivated friendship. The odd thing is that I cannot remember when or how I came to meet Edith Wharton. I think it must be because from the first meeting, we seemed always to have known each other. I think we knew each other at that first now shadowy meeting as well as we knew each other years afterward. When I saw her for the last time, from a distance, she was looking out of the window of her home at Pavillon Colombe in Saint Brice pale and tired and ill, forbidden by the doctor to receive anyone. Our own friendship had been a singular one, considering the fact that we came of worlds so utterly different. She herself came from the stock of old New York, out of a world that was restricted and even provincial, against which she revolted. While whatever I may be was born of the frontier, of that very world which she derided so bitterly in the custom of the country. Her god was Hamilton, the god of the Anglophile bankers and merchants of New York. And my own was Jefferson, the man, the agrarian idealist, who liked nothing better than staying until dawn incognito among the visitors of the nightclubs of his day. The arguments over the two men between us attained naturally the proportions of a humorous feud. Between us, as there should be between all prominent writers, there was a kind of fierce rivalry. Not enough has been made of the gravity of her revolt against that old New York world. 
in that world, she found herself almost alone. It was a world in which the freedom of the artist and even friendship with men was impossible. So there was nothing left for her but to escape. And she found her haven in an enchanted garden in which Henry James was the head gardener, the one to whom the apprentice gardeners all listened breathless while he intoned. Above all, this gardener and his apprentices understood the quiet art of living well. Within the borders of the garden wall, he had built about himself and them. Within its walls flourished culture in its finest sense. A knowledge of art surprisingly profound, an intellectual curiosity regarding the new, the taste of excellent food, the beauty of nature and of a garden. These and a thousand more things. For those who did not know her, it doubtless seems unbelievable that the Edith Wharton who wrote of manners should love the earth. Yet it's true. I think I never knew anyone who loved it more. For her, a drought was a kind of illness from which she herself suffered physically and the persistent cold rain which ruined the roses and damaged the prospects of a magnificent flowering was a kind of personal agony. The bond between us, which was a close bond, as close in many senses as I've ever known, was less that of writing than of gardening. We seldom discussed our writing, but we talked frequently and at great length of our dahlias and petunias, our green peas and our lettuces. If she had a rare or especially fine flower or vegetable, she sent or brought a sample of it to us from Sambrix, for we were near neighbors just north of Paris. I recall her telling me how she acquired her home, the Pavillon Colombe in Sambrix. After the war, I longed to get away from Paris, and my friend, Elisina Tyler, found a lovely little house in the northern suburb of Sambrice. It had been deserted by its owners, as all had been in the war, and I fell in love with it despite its dirt and squalor. At last, I was to have a garden again, and a kitchen garden with pear and apple trees. It was summer after a long storm. The little house has never failed me since, and I settled into peace and order, writing and gardening. I would love to ramble about through the deep woods and countryside. Yet what I recall on those rambles is my secret sensitivity to the landscape. I was in deep and solitary communion whenever I was alone with nature. It was the same tremor that stirred in me in the spring woods when I heard the whisper of the arbutus and the starry choir of the dogwoods. It has never since been still. I'm not sure if I'm happier talking about writing or gardens, but I am so thankful there are a few friends with whom I can do both. Solly, November 1931. Dear Mrs. Wharton, we were delighted to have news of you and your garden. I envy you having a garden which shows signs of activity. Ours is completely dormant except for a few pansies, wallflowers, pecrets, and anemones, which insist on blooming. The planting, manuring, and pruning is all done. There's nothing left to do. Even the new garden on the other side of the Nonette River is finished, except the grass planting, which cannot be done now. Really, next year, the place should be a jungle. I found another literary gardener in the person of Gertrude Stein whose approach, needless to say, is far more intellectual and less passionate than our own. Uh, I suppose gardening is the best insurance against the complications and depressions of this age. Thank heaven I'm nearly at the end of my novel, A Modern Hero. It's reached the point where it carries itself along, gaining speed and demanding to be finished, which I find is always an excellent sign. Oh, I, I'm bringing this to an abrupt close as I've just decided to go into Paris and see the picture which was made of my last novel, 
before I leave to join Mary and the children in Switzerland. I'm sure Mary joins me as well in the best of wishes, Louis Bromfield. I'm Claire. January 1932. My dear Louis, your book, A Modern Hero, came the day before yesterday, and I have already snatched at a few pages of it, and I'm wanting more. The highest tribute from one novelist to another. I'm much excited by the discovery that while you were creating your character, Claire Creighton at St. Lee, I was putting the finishing touches to her twin sister at my home in St. Brice. You'll see, and I think agree, when I introduce my character, Floss Delaney, in The Gods Arrive to You next September. <laughs> By the way, I had a letter from my publisher the other day asking if I would explain the meaning of my title, The Gods Arrive, for the benefit of the book agents, or whatever they are called, who were puzzled. I was quite amused they didn't recognize the allusion to Emerson. When half gods go, the gods arrive. It's quite apt as an expression of my character's tumultuous romance. Oh, and I've also had a letter from an admiring male reader who tells me that he wants my autograph because, quote, writers sometimes run naked into the arms of their readers when they, I trust he means the writers, least expect it. <laughs> If you can break away from skiing in the Alps before we, we, we both return north, I should love to show you St. Clair. Yours ever, Edith. February 1932. Dear Edith, this is just a thank you for the delightful hours at your home in Provence. It's impossible to say how much I enjoyed the visit, especially after a winter spent among the mediocre mines which seem to congregate here in Switzerland. I had imagined that your home St. Clair was a lovely place, but the reality exceeded any of my imaginings. I'm not given to coveting the homes of other people, large or small, but I can think of no house and park I've ever seen as completely satisfying as yours. I wanted so much to read the opening pages of your memoirs. Perhaps you'll let me see them when I come to St. Brice. Nothing could interest me more. Let's have news of you soon. Mary joins me in sending much love. She's feeling rather tired and extremely bored, which I can well appreciate, but she only has two months longer to wait. Louis Brownfield. Saint Lee, April 28th, 1932. Dear Edith, many thanks for the card and the telegram. Mary, I know, wrote you about the coverlet, which is a beauty. The baby, our third girl, arrived Monday night with comparatively few complications and is very big and fat and hearty. We've named her Ellen Margaret after her two grandmothers. Ah, oh, the garden is a miracle just now. We've lost literally not one plant during the winter and everything is now a riot of flowers and all the fruit blossoms are coming out. Oh, I scarcely believed it possible to have such a show so early in the year. The wallflowers are particularly miraculous, some of them nearly three feet high and very bushy. Of course, it'll all be better and better as time goes on. Oh, Sinclair Lewis is here in Paris at the moment. I gather from newspapers is not behaving himself too well. Perhaps you've seen some of the stories. They've been rather veiled, but thoroughly malicious, and I gather from them that He's been drunk ever since he left America. I sent him a telegram, but it fell into a great void. I don't like seeing him in that state. It appears that he'll only speak German and sounds rather unbalanced. You know, do write soon and give us news of yourself. With much love from us both. Oh, I've had some luck lately with selling stories to the movies, so the Exchequer is well filled at this depressing time which is all very pleasant. These things appear to move in cycles. May this be a long one, Lewis. St. Clair, May 2nd, 1932. My dear Lewis, I was so glad to get your letter. I jubilate over the coming of your daughter, Ellen Margaret, into this troubled world. You make me envious with your spring flowers. I wish I could make you envious with some of mine here. You must 
if you haven't already, plant some of the marvelous hybrid Iris Desjardins. Mine are a perfect glory now. My species irises are enchanting too, and even the shy Pavonia has produced one exquisite flower. But this is not Country Life magazine, and I must stop, but oh, my peonies. The account of Sinclair Lewis is sickening. I had been appalled back in 1921 to learn that my Pulitzer Prize for the Age of Innocence should have gone instead to his Main Street. But I wrote to him at the time with an apologetic letter, and he responded with a note so kind and generous that I warmed to him and his dear first wife, Grace. In fact, I was most pleased when he dedicated Babbitt to me the following year. They visited me several times, as perhaps I've mentioned. But have you seen the new wife's mug? That newspaper woman, Dorothy Thompson? She looks like a chucker out and will need to be. Oh, I wrote a long, enthusiastic letter to wife number one about her book, but have had no answer. At any rate, I have such a lot to say about gardens, too. We must talk soon. I want to swank about the roses to you and Mary before long, for they've got their second wind now. How I wish you could drop in and have a talk on the terrace. I should love to show you my memoirs, but I'm afraid not for another week or ten days, as I've torn it all about and it must be almost entirely recopied. You've beaten me on autobiographies with your forthcoming book, The Farm, for mine is not coming out in book form until next winter, though I finished it some time ago. It will first adorn the pages of the Ladies' Home Journal, the editor, which is at present is trying to get out of paying the price he offered me for the serial two years ago. I am so glad your movie sales are going well. I'm trying to think of a happy ending subject, but there are none. Yours of ever affectionately, Edith W. Wasn't it you, by the way, who told me to read Beverly Nichols' Down the Garden Path? Oh, it's delicious, and I no longer hate him. My nymphonias are worth the price of admission alone. Come and see soon. February 1933. Dear Edith, this is just a line to say that the voyage to India is being the greatest success. Thus far, we've been to Baroda, where we were entertained in feudal splendor and extravagance for 10 days, thence to Kush Bahar, where we spent 10 days shooting leopards and leading a life that was unbelievably romantic. <laughs> the palace is beautiful in a perfectly extravagant fashion. Little farms and big patches of luxuriant jungle with lovely rivers and artificial lakes everywhere. And for a backdrop, the whole snow white range of the Himalayas. In the midst of it stands the palace, uh, an enormous Italian Renaissance building where we stayed. At sunset, the jackals swarm over the park of the palace, howling and screaming, and the, the leopards come into the rose garden. Roses, by the way, are magnificent in Bengal. From the village comes the sound of music and temple gongs. And inside the palace, one has cocktails and a magnificent dinner in a room lined with literally hundreds of gold and silver racing cups <laughs> to the accompaniment of the latest jazz. None of it makes sense, but all of it is thoroughly delightful and fantastic. We sail for home on March 13th, landing at Genoa, so there's no chance of our passing through Provence on the way home, much to our regret. We shall be back in saint Lee by April 1st. I found a new flower, name unknown, which we may be able to grow in Europe. I'll send you some of the seeds. It's a perennial in gentle climates and looks like a single marigold, but is flame color. Mary joins me in sending love. My secretary, George Hawkins, also sends his best wishes. As ever, Lewis. Unclair, March 24th, 1933. My dear Lewis. You must be approaching San Lee by this time, and I want my greeting to meet you there. I was delighted by your picturesque description of the Indian adventure, and I'm so glad it's been such a great success. It reminds me of a trip I took to Morocco in 1917, in the midst of the war. The brief enchantment of this journey through a country still completely untouched by foreign travel was like a, a burst of sunlight between storm clouds. It's a curious, beautiful country, rich in landscape and architecture. 
like you, I could taste the transient joy of wandering in cities of ancient mystery. I'm also equally glad that you and Mary did not come and see me this winter, for we really have not had three good days of weather on end since the beginning of the year. Oddly enough, however, it, it did not freeze though it did every other hateful thing it could, so I have struggled through without losing any plants. The mention of plants reminds me that someone recommended to me the other day Barr's new dwarf Michaelmas daisies. Do you know them? I've sent for them and they sound delightful and ought to look jolly in a rock garden. Directly after Easter, I'm leaving for Rome and Naples. I shall look forward to seeing you both in June. Meanwhile, this brings all my fond wishes for the success of your spring garden. Many messages to Mary and best regards to Mr. Hawkins. Yours affectionately, Edith Wharton. Paris, June 12th, 1933. My dear Louis, what a kind friend you are. Your letter warms my heart. As long as I have friends like you and the Gelais, I shall never quite feel chilly and grown old. I shan't be at Pavillon Colombe until early in July due, due to my housemaid's illness. I've been sitting here in Paris at the Hotel de Crayon, looking at the flowers and eating the fruit brought from my home by my gardener, Emile, and I simply can't stand it. So I'm going over to England on Friday to do some motoring until I can get into my own house again. I'm so glad Mary is better. Please give her many messages from me and thank Mr. Hawkins for his kindness. I should get out to San Lee before Friday, but I'm afraid I have too many things to do in Paris. By the way, I do have very fond, particular memories of a hotel in San Lee. That's a story for a more intimate tete a tete. <laughs> the editor, with cold feet from the Ladies Home Journal, has come into line and is paying the sum agreed upon. I'm very eager for your book, The Farm. Do have it sent to me. Oh, have you seen a new semi-double rose called Scorcher? Its color picture looks superlative. Yes, the garden is the last moral life preserver left. I pity those who haven't have it. Yours ever affectionately, Edith. August 1st, 1933. Edith, Mary and I send you brief greetings from Stockholm. I've had some long chats here with Mrs. Pearl Buck whom I welcomed to our Pulitzer Prize Club, or should I say Pulsifer Prize, as you so, so slyly named the literary prize in your Hudson River bracketed. Mrs. Buck and I compared notes on our respective observations of China and India, farming and the good earth in the wholesome Orient versus the decadent Occident. I abandoned my idea of buying a farm in India and we're now looking to buy instead somewhere in America, perhaps in Maryland. As ever, Lewis. Pavillon Colomb, August 8th, 1933. My dear Lewis, how good of you to remember me in Stockholm. I should like to have met Mrs. Buck. The good earth was a revelation and, and took the world by surprise. Uh, I, but I don't dare go to those Nordic lands for I shall come back more nauseated than ever with suburban France. Have you found your garden in Sunley Grilled? That is, if you're back, here my poor rhododendrons look as if they've been used to be carpets with. What weather? Do you really think your peerless cook would add to all her other merits that of ordering me a bottle or two of Grandpa's Calvados? I'm told if Bromfield said his cook could get you some of the real thing, for God's sakes, ask him. <laughs> I transmit this cry of the heart. Best greetings to you all. And when you do come back, come and see my primula. Yours affectionately, Edith. September 18th, 1933. My dear Louis, I lunched in the town of San Lee yesterday and called after lunch with the idea of picking up your new book and the Calvados. But perceiving that everyone who was not at Marty Carlo was lunching with you, I gave up the attempt to force my way through the throngs of motor car at your door and snatched the precious Calvados from your kind cook. Especially wanted to avoid a lecture from Miss Stein about her latest art acquisition. I frankly don't know how you abide that whole set. I recall a simply awful visit from F. Scott Fitzgerald to Pavillon Colombe. 
I invited him and Mrs. Fitzgerald to tea after The Great Gatsby had just come out. Mrs. Fitzgerald declined on the grounds I suspect she didn't want to feel provincial. So Mr. Fitzgerald came along with my friend, Tenny Chandler. Apparently he was nervous to meet me, so he fortified himself with a few drinks, a few too many drinks, for he staggered into my home and proceeded to ramble on with irreverent and irrelevant stories. I think he meant to impress me. He didn't. I'm afraid I can't lunch this week as I'm tied up with engagements. When I get back, I'll call up and do. Please drop the farm at my door if you happen to pass. Yours affectionately, Edith. Oh, when I tried to pay for the Calvados, I was assured it was a gift. Please accept all my gratitude. September 28th, 1933. My dear Lewis, what a thunderbolt. Your letter announcing your imminent departure for America just came as I was starting on a week's tour in Vendee and Carrez. I wish that writing a book called The Farm wouldn't immediately make you decide to buy one. If action always follows so rapidly on thought, you'll have an agitated existence, and so will Mary. I can't decipher the last date of your departure, but I hope it's not until late in October. Do call up soon, for we must meet yours affectionately. Edith. Princeton, New Jersey, January 18th, 1934. Dear Edith, we've been longing for news of you and I've done my best to settle down and write a letter every day since I've been here, but words are not adequate to describe the frantic scramble of activity we've been lost in lately. As you see, we're living in Princeton, New Jersey, where we found a big and charming home in the best American tradition. The sort wherein one feels immediately at home. I don't know how well you know the town, but I think it's one of the most beautiful in America. Oh, I do love it here, especially now when there's so many exciting things going on. I miss you and the gelées and the garden, but otherwise I feel no pull toward France at the moment. The theater is so good, the music as good, the whole of life so full of richness and positive feeling. I've never loved America so profoundly. Principally, I think, because with the crisis of the depression, it's become for a little while my America, an America of farmers and agriculture, a Jeffersonian America. The bankers and merchants, those Hamiltonians, are out. I am sure to your dismay, Hamiltonian, that you are. It's very amusing to find bankers looked on as pariahs. It's very odd to go out to dinner and to find the financial geniuses of yesterday eating humbly and seated with meekness without the pomposity of which only bankers are capable. Oh, there's a story about two men who met for the first time in years. One said to the other, well, Jim, what are you doing now? Jim turned away with a bowed head and murmured, I'm a banker, but don't tell my mother. She thinks I'm playing piano in a brothel. <laughs> oh, do write and tell us news. I've done a play which it appears will be produced either with Ina Clare or Tallulah Bankhead, both excellent actresses, first here and then in London or vice versa. Oh, so that's exciting. We miss seeing you, but we're looking forward to your return to some breeze in the summer. The farm has been very successful, and judging from the fan mail, I've converted whole families of Hamiltonians to the true faith. We miss seeing you, but are uh, looking forward to your return to some breeze in the summer. Ah, the farm has been very successful. As I said, George Hawkins and Mary join me in sending the love of all the Bromfield family. Write soon. Affectionately, Louis Bromfield. Sinclair, March 16th, 1934. My dear Lewis, it was such a pleasure to get your delightful letter that I wanted to answer it at once. You make me dizzy with all your plans for novels and plays and movies. I've had several cinema proposals, but they seem to fade away after time and so far no cash has resulted. But my memoirs are coming out in a few weeks 
and I think I've made a success with the story Bread Upon the Water, which apparently is to be filmed. My garden has been a great joy this winter. I'm looking forward impatiently to the horticultural pleasures of Sunbreeze, where I shall probably arrive in June. I hope to hear from you, and I wonder if the first sight of your flowers will not make you waver in your allegiance to America. However, I'm sure you're right in feeling you ought to be there now, and I only hope that you will continue to lead a double life in which San Lee is still included. All my greetings to Mary and the infants. Yours affectionately, Edith W. San Lee, April 18th, 1934. Dear Edith, we were delighted to have your welcoming card and letter to hear that the winter has passed so well without any apparent frosts. I returned home to find that Saint Lee had had the hardest winter since 1870. About a fourth of the perennials in all of the Penstemons, of which I was very proud, were killed. Also about three quarters of the dahlias, virtually my whole collection. Anyway, it gives me something to start on again. Fortunately, I have enough plants in my nursery to fill the, the gaps. I hope Saint Brice has not suffered so severely. New York was deliriously exciting. I, I wrote and sold a play there while there called Deluxe, about the end of all the people who live on fat dividends. America, and especially New York, are fantastic and colorful. I had adventures worthy of the Arabian Nights. There's a kind of haphazard beauty born, I suppose, of the colossal vitality, which I find very thrilling not to mention those other qualities of youth and a passion for gambling and a kind of gusto and abandon, which I cannot do without for long. Ah, still, it is very nice to be back again. Oh, the forest is lovely and the life so peaceful and lazy. We are hoping that we shall suffer less this year from the descent of the casual American caller. Last Sunday, we decided firmly that we would not admit more than five people. But when lunch time arrived, there were 14 in spite of everything we could do. We are awaiting impatiently your return. Affectionately, Louis Bromfield. St. Clair, April 20th, 1934. My dear Lewis, I was delighted to get your letter, but so sorry the elements have been so cruel to your lovely terraces. You take it so much less to heart than I would. When the gardens here were devastated by a freeze in 1929, I nearly died from the shock. My own fibers were so closely interwoven with all those roots and tendrils. However, you are probably having much more fun replanting than if you found everything in perfect order, and I will save my pity till we meet and send you only my congratulations on the play. I cannot imagine how you combine so much literary industry with so much social activity, but then I have not got a Mary and a Mr. Hawkins to sustain my fainting spirit. Yours ever affectionately, Edith Wharton. Horace, this will reach you on Sunday, just as you are sitting down to a repast for 40. <laughs> Rome, September 30, 1934. My dear Lewis, your kind letter about my book was forwarded to me here, and I should have thanked you for it at once, for it gave me great pleasure. It was especially appreciated, because all my other communiques have been so distressing lately. Our friend, Louis Gillet, sent me a report of the Nuremberg rally. Relating it was like a vision of the Antichrist, a scene from the apocalypse. And Elisina Tyler sent me a copy of Herr Hitler's book. I would not read it immediately because I had guests visiting and reading Hitler would seem like blasphemy against all this beauty. But the voice of Hitler is making itself heard, more frightening than any ghost story I could write. I don't think this world gloom agrees with me. I'm afraid that General Foch was right in 1921 about the Treaty of Versailles. It was just a blueprint for a war 20 years to come. I'm vividly reminded of those awful days of war we endured. The dazed and ragged refugees with no hope left in their eyes. Paris, a city of extinguished lamps, 
shuttered windows, deserted streets. Week after week of vague news, the enemy baffled but ever menacing. Everywhere death, suffering, destruction, without any hope of compensating good to come in the slow, endless waste. I remember walking the streets of Paris, pursued by the visions I had witnessed on the battlefronts in the la that land of doom. I had made a number of visits to the trenches to write my essays to convince the Americans to join the war effort. I was haunted by visions of fathomless mud, rat haunted trenches, men dying in barbed wire or freezing in the mud and blood of the trenches. But I would, I would do it again, raise money for my charities, create homes and hospitals and orphanages, but my body grows weak and my heart grows weary at the prospect of the test. To combat this overwhelming sadness, this expectation of Hitler's aggression, I look to my friends, to my little dogs, my gardens. Do send word of yourself and your family. Your letters brighten my day as if they were an azalea on a spring day. Yours affectionately, Edith. It's only October 1934. Dear Edith, I also see black clouds against the horizon here in Europe. And your memories conjure my own time in France and the Great War. I was a yokel in the ambulance corps, experiencing the color, confusion, sound, fury, pain, the whole gamut of human emotions compressed into a few months. And the innumerable nationalities brought home the immensity of the struggle. An American hauls French wounded to a hospital where they are unloaded by coolies from Tonkin. On the way, he passes Italians mending the road and Senegalese guarding German prisoners and then gives a lift to a kilty from the great British Empire. Is there no escape from another great war? I think more and more of moving my family to America, or not to India, though I'll be visiting there again soon, but to America. I know you can't conceive of going back there to live. You are too deeply rooted here in France now, though at least you are not one of those idiotic Americans who seek to be more French than the French, thank goodness. You don't like Frenchmen because they're French or Englishmen because they're English. You're the perfect international who likes her friends, regardless of race or color, creed or nationality, for their spirit, their kindliness, their intelligence. My friend Eric Maria Remarque once told me a story that reminds me of you, dear Edith. <laughs> now it's difficult to conceive of two writers more remote from each other than you and Remark. Two books could scarcely be, well, save in their craftsmanship, more different than The Age of Innocence and All Quiet on the Western Front. But you two have much in common. His story concerns two men, strangers, seated at a bar in Paris. A little drunk, the first one addresses the second, who also has had a drink too many. The first man asks the second, Do you like Americans? And the second man says angrily, No. The first man continues, Do you like English? And again comes the surly answer, No. French? asks the first, No. Germans? No. Italians? No. Then after a moment's baffled pause, the first man asks, well, who do you like? I like my friends. <laughs> Affectionately, Lewis. St. Clair, 1935, December 11th. Dear Lewis, so many thanks for your good letter. I'm delighted to hear you are well and hope you will have time to scribble me a line every now and again between this and the departure for India. I'm glad to know the children like the dolls, as they were dressed by one of my protégés, a poor girl at Sarce who does the most beautiful knitting. Yours affectionately, Edith. 
My Soul in India, February 22nd, 1936. Dear Edith, ah, I received your letter in Sumatra and was delighted to have it. Ever since I wrote, George Hawkins and I have been wandering about the Malay states and Dutch East Indies and are now here in Mysore. Poor health prevented Mary from accompanying us, so she awaits us in Cairo. I must say, the more I see of the East, the more attractive it becomes, and it's a beautiful relief from the sick and I suspect dying civilization of Europe. Penang is a sort of paradise on earth and Singapore is unbelievably fascinating and Sumatra of indescribable beauty. Rest were rather disappointing and Bali, except for the landscape and some of the dancing, a complete sell. The Dutch have so over-organized over it as a tourist place that it's more like a world's fair than an authentic island. I'm enclosing some New York reviews of the play of your Ethan Frome, if you haven't seen them already. <laughs> the play is a tremendous hit, even bigger than The Old Maid. Love in haste, Lewis. I have just shot a magnificent tiger. Sonley, May 1936. Dear Edith, I should have written you long ago to thank you for the book of your stories the world over, but I've been rushed to death with work both in the garden and at the writing table ever since I came back from India. Really, the world, or the West at least, is becoming insufferable with strikes and calls for revolution. The East, and especially India, was lovely and remote and calm this winter. Here, all the right are moaning and groaning about the troubles which they have brought on themselves. A good part of the right talks of nothing but how to get its money across the channel. It's all pretty discouraging. At the moment, I don't even know whether this letter will ever reach you, as there are rumors this morning of the post and the railways shutting down as well. In any case, nature continues to take no notice of the imbecilities of mankind. And despite even the bad weather, the garden is lovely, and the roses have never been so fine. We returned from India with a mongoose we have named Ricky Tiki Tavi, who leaps with the agility of killer of snakes onto my back. When I fell asleep in the garden on the grass recently, she deposited a recently murdered mouse on my neck. Mary has read your stories and loves them, and I'm just reading them, and they give me great pleasure. I'm finishing the monumental Indian novel, and then I think I shall take another holiday. <laughs> I suppose you will be at St. Clair until about the 15th. Life is probably more quiet there than in the neighborhood of Paris, which is covered like a pincushion with red flags. In any case, all of us send love as always. Affectionately, Lewis. Sinclair, December 17th, 1936. Dear Lewis, don't you think the fiction writers, poor things, had better go out of business seeing the class of goods the royals are supplying us with the king's abdication for Mrs. Simpson? <laughs> the idea of Edward VIII taking refuge with the former Mrs. Spotswood, a Brooklyn's dentist ex-wife, no less, and her new husband, the Baron, in his castle in Vienna, while Mrs. Simpson is in seclusion in Cannes, delights me mightily. I remember Mrs. Spotswood when she was divided by several divorces from the lofty eminence she now occupies. But what I really meant to write about is to ask if you will kindly put on a postcard the address of the nursery man, nursery man near Montefontaine, where we went one day last summer. I want to order a very big and splendid magnolia. How are you all? I suppose after Christmas, you'll be off to ski land. And how is the darling mongoose? Are you sure she'll be kept warm while you're away? My best greetings to the household and many Christmas vows. Yours ever, Edith. Sinclair, March 3rd, 1937. My dear Lewis, I have just had a letter from my niece, Beatrix Ferrand from California, where everything is frozen her garden wiped out, no sun all winter, etc. I'm sure you remember my niece, don't you? She has designed hundreds of gardens, including the White House and the gardens of Yale and Princeton, 
among so many others. I was so very proud of her when she became one of the founding members of the American Society for Landscape Gardeners and Landscape Architects, excuse me. I, she prefers the name Landscape Gardener. I'm happy that my social connections helped to get her started. And she does say that her trips to Europe studying Italian Renaissance gardens and the book I published about them helped to launch her career. But she has made a name for herself quite on her own as the most prominent woman in landscape gardening. And what do you suppose our winter here has been? The loveliest since 1920 or thereabouts, all sunshine and warmth and blue and gold postcard effects, wisteria in bloom, roses over temporarily and hyacinths ditto, and all the other bulbs racing against each other into the sun, and our only and rather serious grievance, the persistent lack of rain. This is an inadequate response to your delightful letter and would be much longer if I had not gone back to my literary work as a trained nurse, I had once called it. With a sudden increase in ads, the magazines have more pages to pad out with fiction and are yammering for it at pre-slump prices. I'm hasting to fill this demand and my correspondence is therefore cur curtailed but not my affection for the friends to whom I fail to write. My vista of recovered health in the spring has been clouded over by successive attacks of flu in January and now a queer sort of relapse, which left me weak as a cat. After what so ordinary seemed like an ordinary snuffle cold, but I'm used to being an invalid now and it is full of oases and hidden springs. Do send me news of all of you, including the lovely mongoose. Yours ever affectionately, Edith. Pavillon Cologne, May 16th, 1937. Dearest Lewis, how sorry I am not to be able to see you this afternoon. I should have been quite willing to risk the fatigue, but Alicina and my maid behaved so awfully about it, I had no alternative to it to go on snoozing on the sofa. Alas, just after I wrote you, I went kaput. Partly, I think, because I lost my little Pekingese linky. During the last years of the Roman Empire, the emperors had a passion for human curiosities. And whenever one was found, he or she or, or it was shipped to Rome, for they, they mostly came from Egypt. Once they found a boy who understood what the birds said. I have always been like that about dogs, ever since I was a baby. We really communicated with each other, and no one had such wise things to say as my Linky. Oh, my little dog. My best greetings to your household. Yours ever affectionately, Edith. Oh, me. How thankful I am to remember, whether it's to people or places and occasions, I've always known the gods the moment I met them. How clearly I remember saying to myself once by a stream in Compostela in, France, in Spain, as I looked up the snow through the pink oleanders, old girl, this is one of the pinnacles. One of my most vivid memories of Edith Wharton was of the summer before she died. She had been ill and she was tired. And when she came to lunch, I chanced to tell her of a dahlia breeder and grower who lived and had a garden in the village of Aumont, a little way from Saint-Lys. He was a strange, wild character, a man with bright blue eyes and fierce mustache, a, a communist, not in the dull doctrinaire way, but in a, a, a primitive, fundamental fashion. He wanted desperately that the world should be a fine and beautiful place. He bred dahlias fine and beautiful new varieties. Communism was something that Edith never understood and which she regarded with horror, but she didn't hold his communism against my friend, the dahlia grower. She knew, I think, as she knew so many things, that between her and himself, there was a bond beyond all differences of politics. When he saw that she loved and understood all plants, between the two of them, Edith Wharton, friend of Henry James, who dined in the most beautiful homes in the world, and this half-wild communist peasant, 
something wonderful and beautiful happened. For a time, they became brother and sister. They talked of flowers, of soil, of fertilizers, of experiments, of climates, and she ordered from him dahlia after dahlia, which she never lived to see in flower. She was weary when at last, later in the afternoon, she finished tea and set out for Saint-Brie. But I had never seen her happier. I wish I knew what people meant when they say they find emptiness in this wonderful adventure of living, which seems to me to pile up its glories like a horizon-wide sunset as the light declines. I'm afraid I'm incorrigible. Despite all I've seen, I still love life. I love wonder and I love adventure. It was the last afternoon we spent together. I, I did see her again distantly when she was dying. On the day I came to see the garden, but it was more like seeing a ghost, someone who was already dead framed inside one of the lovely windows of the pink facade of Pavillon Cologne. Now she was tired and ill and reconciled to death. But that day, among the dahlias, although she had been very ill only a little while before, the old vitality charged the frail body and the precise, astute brain. And I think it's always thus that I will remember her, moving among the glorious dahlias. She was happy that day because she had found new and extravagant beauties in the world and because she had made a new friend. That last sight of her moving among the flowers was the picture of a lady a very great one. Thank you so much for that. John Dennis Anderson, Karen Varanch, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And to bookend uh, a cultivated friendship, we heard a passage from uh, Edith Wharton beforehand, and now just a, a brief piece from Louis Bromfield. Uh, Bromfield and Horton, as you, as you learned by, by listening to A Cultivated Friendship, uh, spent time at their respective homes in France at the same time. And that is where a lot of their, their friendship developed. Shortly after Edith Horton died, uh, Louis Bromfield had to leave the home in France that he had come to love. He had to leave it behind. And this passage that I'm about to read comes from his memoir, Pleasant Valley. This is a section of Pleasant Valley by Louis Bromfield. The hardest thing for me to bear in leaving France and Europe was not the loss of the intellectual life I had known there nor the curious special freedom which a foreigner knows in a country he loves, nor the good food, nor even the friends I would be leaving behind. The thing I would miss most, the thing to which I was most attached, were the old house and the few acres of land spread along the banks of a little river called the Nonette. Land, earth, in which I had worked for 15 years, planting and cultivating until the tiny landscape itself had changed. If I never saw it again, a part of my heart would always be there, in the earth, the old walls, the trees and vines I had planted, in the friendships that piece of earth had brought me with horticulturalists, farmers, peasants, market gardeners, and the working men whose communal gardens adjoined my own.
That's our Southwick for this semester. And before we say our goodbyes, I would be remiss if I did not recognize that today is May 4th, and it's the 51st anniversary of the killings at Kent State University in Ohio. On this date in 1970, four students were killed and nine others were injured by the Ohio National Guard. This event has been widely seen as really the beginning of the end of the Vietnam War. The four students who were killed, two were involved in campus protests against the expansion of the campaign in Vietnam, and two others were simply observing the protests from the sidelines. But in the melee that followed, the four students were killed. Their names are Allison Krauss, Jeffrey Miller, Sandra Schuer, William Schroeder. The Communication Studies Department has a long history of commemorating the tragedy at Kent. So today, once again, let's just pause to reflect, to remember, and to honor. Again, thank you so much for attending the recital this time around, and have a great summer. We'll see you next semester.